Okay, hello everyone. It's time to start. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being here to this uh, first panel in the afternoon, even though there are many parallel panels going on, so thank you very much for choosing our panel, which will be on the proposed regulation laying down rules to combat and protect child sexual abuse, uh, or the famous CSAM regulation proposal still. As we know, the protection of children online is a top priority for the EU, which reflects also in the 2020 EU strategy, and uh, we have seen this reflected in legislative measures such as the Digital Services Act, the NIS Directive, and also mainly the CSAM proposal. However, the latter has sparked significant debate, mainly concerning uh, pr privacy and surveillance. Um, the, propose the proposed regulation introduces mandatory detection measures to service providers aimed at tackling known and new child sexual abuse material as well as grooming activities. While there is a clear consensus on the necessity for protecting children online, it is imperative that we address concerns regarding potential impact on fundamental rights, such as the right to privacy, confidentiality of communication, but also presumption of innocence. Today, we will take a pragmatic approach informed by the capabilities and limitations of current automation tools for detecting CSAM, and grooming to assess the feasibility and implications of integrating such tools into the proposed legal framework. Without further ado, I'd like to give the floor to our esteemed speakers uh, who bring wealth of knowledge and expertise in uh, this important topic. First, we have Emily Sliffer. Emily is Director of Policy at Thorn, a nonprofit organization that builds technology to defend children from online child sexual abuse. Prior to joining Thorne, she worked for the UK Home Office in the British Embassy in Washington. She has an MA in European Union Policy Studies. Emily, uh, Thorne Safer Tool is claimed to be an all-in-one solution to detect, review, and report known and new CSAM at scale. Additionally, together with the Tech Coalition, Thorne has recently announced a new initiative to tackle online grooming. They have developed an NLP classifier that detects and categorizes when online content or behavior might be related to grooming. As this is one of the main promises of the European Commission's CSAM proposal, can you provide an overview of how the two tools work in the back end and how is privacy of communication guaranteed in the detection process? And you have to provide this overview in eight minutes. <laughs> yes, um, can I get the slides pulled up? I did bring slides with me, um, thank you. I will be doing this rapid fire, um, so if you are a data scientist, I apologize in advance because I had to very over overly simplify this in order to make this fit into the eight minutes, um, but I'll go ahead and kick it off there. Uh, let's see, all right. Um, first and foremost, one of the things I always like to talk about is a little bit of the scale of the problem here when we're talking about you know, 104 million pieces, su suspected pieces of child sexual abuse material reported in 2023. We need technology to fight a tech-enabled crime. So that's why Thorn exists. It's why we created the technologies we did. Um, I know that you asked me about two technologies, but I'm going to talk about all three um, just to make sure we get the full spectrum a little bit. But I'll go fast. Um, first, I think, is the one most people are the most familiar with, which is the hashing of images. Um, this is what you do to find known material. So things that have previously been reported to a body, including the IWF, who's sitting next to me. Um, I'll do a quick demo of it just to help you out. Um, we don't use pictures of children or any sort of child sexual abuse material, obviously, so um, for the purpose of this demonstration, you get to look at the various uh, cats and dogs of employees at Thorn. so hopefully that helps brighten up your afternoon a little bit. Um, but to start, sorry, I'm like multiple buttons here. Um, we'll start with this puppy here. Um, the first thing you do is you turn the image into a thumbnail, then you make it black and white, then you grid and value the entire image, then you take, oh, did it go right? Okay, sorry, it's hard to see behind me. Um, then you compare and sum the image, and then you come out with the hashes. So there are two types of hashes that are predominantly used when it comes to child sexual abuse material. First is the MD5 hash, which is a cryptographic perfect match. Um, you're looking at two identical kind of fingerprints. And then the more important one that we see more and more is a perceptual hash, which is uh, the uh, long, long number uh, of, and string of numbers on the left. The reason we use perceptual hashes is so that we can get those kind of fuzzy matches. So if an image is cropped, if there's a small change in the corner, if some of the, uh, uh, the colors are changed slightly, et cetera, we found it really valuable because as you share and change, exchange files and things like that, they change pretty quickly. Um, 
And then for reference, um, in the blue on this, you'll see an original hash, and then in the pink, you'll see the cropped hash, and you can see how they kind of mirror each other and why they're a useful uh, tool. Ooh, we're going fast here. Um, next is image classification. Um, so this is how you identify the unknown images. So images that haven't been seen before. Obviously this is really helpful for finding those you know, children that are currently being abused and are at risk. Um, additionally, it's going to become more and more important as we see the rise of things like generative AI. So as we see the volume increase, in particular uh, for new material, we need systems that work to find it. Um, and as we were just talking about, we were talking about kind of the perceptual ones. Obviously, this is the same cat across all of these images, but in the same scenario, but they're slightly moved and tweaked a little bit. So perceptual hash isn't going to get all of these images. You have to use an image classifier to find all of them. Um, now, why do we use it? Obviously, we use a machine learning AI technique to predict what an image might be. It's a little slower, obviously, than hashing, um, but it'll find all those things, again, not on a hash list. Additionally, we think that you know, the, better, the more you train it, the better it gets, the more uh, specific it gets to the problem. But the other thing that's really important for this is that previously the way that companies would do kind of content moderation is if an image was hashed and matched, um, so they found an abuse image, they would then send a content moderator into that person's account to review all of their material. This way we're now using an image classifier to again try and get to the most privacy preserving way of detecting for this illegal material. Um, so for the purposes of this, again, we're switching from dogs and we're going to cats. So we need to train a model to look for an adorable black cat versus an adorable orange cat. And I always like to describe it as a bit of a kind of decision tree when you're talking about what an image classifier does. So here you have a black cat. What color is it? What texture is it? What shape is it? Um, in particular, we're talking about the ears for this model. Um, and then we have a predictive score that comes out the end. So 45% adorable black cat. 25% orange cat, and then we have an, oh wait, we were only looking between those two cats, but a black cat, still a mammal, similar ears, has a tail, could potentially be a dog. So how do we improve this model now to make it more accurate to what we're trying to find? And that's where we get into um, a random forest classifier here. So again, we have the different types of data that are inputted in there, the different decision trees. Oh, oh, oh there we go, sorry, got behind on a slide. Um, so we have the, the different data that's inputted in here, the different decision trees, the predictive scores, and then a majority vote. Um, and as you're doing this, you would continue to improve and put more data in. So again, now you can see under the final prediction score, you're getting much closer to that adorable black cat. All right. um, obviously, these models need to be retrained with new data, one as trends change, but then also um, as you get feedback from who is ever using the classifier. Um, when we first launched our classifier, and it was kind of in what we call beta form, um, we realized we were getting a lot of feedback um, that we had a zebra problem, because in the background of a lot of child sexual abuse material, there were black and white stripes or zebra prints. So we very quickly went in, added some zebras in, said this is not what we want to find, um, and were able to adjust it. Um, when it comes to our classifier, our classifier specifically looks for child sexual abuse material, so it has three different categories. So instead of black hat, orange cat, black dog. Um, we have actual child sexual abuse material that we've trained off of thanks to some trusted partners. We use adult pornography content because obviously you're looking, for, you want to make sure it doesn't find the things that could be the most similar. And then we have a huge uh, data set of kind of benign images. Those could be the zebras, but then they can also be those kind of benign innocent images of um, youth, whether they're on the beach, in the bathtub, et cetera, because it wants to know the pattern of what abuse looks like. And just like consent in the real world, abuse versus consent looks very different in an image and a classifier is able to tell the difference. All right, last one, almost there. I don't know where we are timing, but hopefully I'm doing okay. Um, we wanna talk about text-based classification. Um, now the solution I'm going to talk about is only Thorne's solution. We also, oh, well, hold on, oops. Uh, we also created our solution um, as kind of a, a, a spurred innovation. This is not going to be the only solution for grooming, and it shouldn't be. We're going to need a lot more solutions than just what Thorne creates, but nobody was looking at how do we prevent it? How do we prevent this abuse from happening? Um, those first two tools we talked about are the abuse has happened, it's been recorded. How do we start looking for some preventative solutions so that way hopefully we can work on that downstream? Um, and obviously there's a lot of challenges to it. Obviously grooming shows up very differently um, online um, and especially depending on the platform. Um, there are different forms of grooming that make detection extremely difficult. Um, so it takes a lot of academic study to figure out what, what are the patterns, what should you be looking for? 
Then, of course, the data is hard to come by. Um, at the moment, all of the data sets to train off of are all in English, so obviously that's a huge barrier for the technology. Um, and then just like with regular CSIM and training, the data is hard um, to share. So the way that we did this is we went through academic studies and we went through and looked for what are the different categories of grooming, what different things can happen on different platforms, um, what do we see in academic literature, et cetera. So we created, we, we labeled um, all of our data um, across 10 categories. Um, and again, I'm really oversimplifying this. If there's a data scientist, please don't come for me. Um, and we said, okay, what are the different categories that we think are going to be the most pertinent to finding grooming conversations? And again, it changes. So on these, com on these different categories, if we're talking about a grooming situation on a dating platform, on a dating platform, it's really normal to make plans to meet, to probably talk about uh, sex, to ha talk about specific sexual acts. That's norm on that platform. But what isn't normal is people talking about being under the age of 18. That would be the thing that they weight the most heavily and that they wouldn't want to see on their dating platform. It would violate the terms and services. Now, think differently, think on like a children's gaming app, they're probably gonna talk about how old they are. They're gonna talk and share a lot of PII, what school they go to, those types of things, maybe what relationships they have. But it, sh they shouldn't be talking about things like self-harm, there shouldn't be kind of pressures and threats for sexual activities that wouldn't be the norm that would be expected on their platform. So we're trying to detect for that. Um, I'm gonna give a slight content warning. The next conversation is a grooming conversation from a publicly available data set. Um, I've redacted anything super sensitive to it, but it's the only way to kind of explain this is to kind of show it a little bit. Um, so here's a grooming conversation. Um, the way ours works is first it goes line by line into the conversation and it detects like, okay, this, this line says sexual act, this one says plan to me, this one talks about a relationship, this one talks about age. And then depending on the weights that you put on those categories, it then gives you a predictive score on what might be happening in that conversation. So 73% likely that this conversation is a grooming conversation based off of the weights for that platform. Again, you have to very much bespoke this to the platform you're viewing. Um, you, you, I believe, touched upon that we're doing a pilot with the Tech Coalition where we're working with six different types of platforms to work on these weights and see what works best for those platforms. Um, but we think it's a really uh, innovative way of looking at grooming, again, to try and get ahead of the curve a little bit to help with those downstream effects. And there we go. Three technologies in 10 minutes or less, and I hand it back to the chair. Excellent. Thank you, Emily. Uh, when you're mentioning about grooming, so detection, detecting grooming means that you need to go into the content of the conversation. So how would, you, how would the use of Thorn solutions uh, affect end-to-end -end encryption as an enable through the right of privacy, as this is one of the main concerns of the CSAM regulation? So at the moment, none of Thorne's technologies are used in encrypted environments. Um, they're all used in um, open source uh, or even private conversations, but they're not encrypted platforms at the moment, so we do not affect uh, any sort of encryption at this stage. That was very fast, <laughs> thank you. Uh, next, we're going to move to uh, Carmela Troncoso, who is joining us online. Uh, do we already have her on screen? Yes. Hello, Carmela. Carmela is an associate professor at EPFL, the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne, where she heads the Spring Lab. She holds a PhD in engineering from QU Leuven, and her research focuses on security and privacy. She has been named 40 under 40 in technology by Fortune in 2020. Uh, Carmela, grooming by definition happens between a child and an adult, which means that there is a need to first filter out communication between the child and adult and then apply the grooming detection technology on this conversation. Um, for this purpose, it means that service providers will need to have an age verification system in place. And uh, I know from Emily, she has already explained to me that uh, Thorn has the grooming detection technology, but it's not related with the age verification technology. So uh, the uh, service providers who would uh, resort to Thorn's technology would need to first have in place an age verification system by themselves. Um, how effective are age verification technologies? So currently we don't really have anything technologically very reliable. There are different things that are being tried because the idea of a verification is important in, in other fields, like for instance, um, to restrict the access to adult contact on the internet. So we have the method of you send a photo of your ID over an email, which is not something very tamper resistant. 
children can take the photos of the ideas of their parents and send them. And in terms of digital alternatives, uh, we are you know, improving and getting more things. Now there is the new EAD coming that arguably will have some of these mechanisms. But it has been already recognized even by the European Commission that we don't have a technology that we really know how to use. And then another question is, let us assume right, that we could have such a technology and that could exist. Then it's the other question of, is it desirable to now implement at large scale the fact that we need to authenticate our age for any service in which we need to talk to other people? You talked in the beginning about the issue of privacy and surveillance. And I want to also make here a um, focus on the fact that it's not only about losing privacy, it is the fact about revealing information or letting others know enables new controls and manipulation, even if we do this in a privacy preserving way, right? Even if we do this locally on the device, there is still the possibility that this information can be abused for purposes that were not in the beginning. So I, as far as I'm concerned, I find this idea that we're going to know in which uh, conversations take place between adults and uh, children, and a little bit futuristic, if at any point we can get there. And also concerning in the sense that nowadays we don't have all of these controls. And that's part of what makes our life nice and free. The fact that we can have different accounts and different devices and we don't need to provide our data to prove anything. The moment that we start having to prove attributes, even if we're not talking about giving my ID, but just having to prove attributes, maybe I need to prove now my age and then tomorrow I need to prove I live in Switzerland and then tomorrow I need to prove that you know I have not have a disease and I don't know how long, but all of these things actually change the way in which we communicate and completely change the way in which we interact with respect to today and the freedom that we have today. And if we're going to go down that path, we should deeply think about why are we doing it. Thank you, Carmela. So I can see your point. Uh, it basically means that uh, it looks like the proposed legislation is uh, its implementation would require the use of uh, technology that it's not uh, well developed yet and also that uh, its use even if it's well developed would lead to further implications in the future depending on the further extension of its use or abuse if we can say so. Um, moving on to another question, in March 2024, the EU presidency introduced changes to the CSAM proposal, as a result of which providers will now have to limit their reporting to users who have been repeatedly flagged of uh, sharing potential child sexual abuse material or being repeatedly involved into uh, grooming uh, situations like attempting to solicit children online. How feasible is this? from a technical perspective, and does this address the privacy concerns that you, together with many other academics and other stakeholders, have been raising recently? So, the short answer is no. Um, the more longer answer is, on the one hand, we have this idea that, okay, we're not going to try for one suspect image, but two or three some number that has to be small because if we have a big number then this stops making sense right because one can still share a lot of, of material and currently given the state of the art of the tools that we know of and uh, maybe uh, we have been told right now that thorn has high precision and high recall but we have never been shown these numbers let alone seen these algorithms and being able to test them in different environments and as far as we know kind of testing of this kind of private algorithms like the one that happened in the UK revealed that these technologies do not provide the performance that is promised. And if we have even a very small error, we need to think about how many images these algorithms are going to see. And even if you have a small error, if you multiply this by billion images or by billion messages that we have on grooming, like billion of messages that are sending just on WhatsApp, right? Let, let's not talk about all of the platforms that we have. Even a very small error, you will many times have 
even if you try twice, you will have an error again. Even just because small errors, when you, when you try many, 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 many times, they will appear. The other problem with this idea of having more than one detection is that it assumes that these detections are going to be independent. But actually, errors are likely to be very dependent. When I'm sending a photo of my kid that had a rash in his, uh, in his belly to the doctor, I don't send her one, I send her four. And if one of them was classified as CSAM, it is more likely that another one of them is classified CSAM because they have the same background, same light, and same everything, right? I'm just kind of moving my phone a little bit with the hope that my photo is good enough. The same thing happens uh, if you're sending photos, like we, uh, Emily mentioned before, like at the beach, like indeed these legitimate innocent places in which we send photos. Like I do send photos to my parents of their grandson when he's doing something yeah, cute in the bath or in, in, at the beach. And then if one of them is dimmed, sees them, it's very likely that the second one will be as well. And as far as we're concerned, we don't know any technology that can really separate this context again I would be more than happy if all of these companies that make these claims actually would put the algorithms out there so that we could check and, be, uh, uh, and, and change our beliefs. But so far, all the evidence we have from a scientific perspective is that this does not happen. And your other question was like, does this solve the privacy issue? And again, to do this, uh, to do this detection, we need to look at the images, right? And once we look at the images, then we know what the images are. And if you know what the images are, then it doesn't matter if you're going to encrypt them afterwards or not to send them. You're already looking at the images. Now, this already breaks encryption. Like the idea of encryption is that nobody looking at the encrypted uh, stream would be able to say if an image is from a dog or from a cat. Now, if I allowed you to look at the images before, and then I ask you, this encrypted image is a dog or a cat. You will remember what you saw and you will be able to tell me which one it is. Another example of this kind of idea is envelopes, right? We are very used to say that envelopes give us privacy in um, the mail postal system. But if I tell you, okay, before we put letters on envelopes, there's gonna be a person that is gonna look at them. And if they don't like what they see, they're gonna send an alarm. And then they're gonna put it on the envelope and send it uh, to the recipient. And if you ask anyone, does this provide privacy, that this envelope still provide privacy, everybody would look at you with the face of, well, how is this even a question? So the fact that we try it twice, or the fact that we do high risk, low risk, if you're scanning something that should be encrypted and therefore knowing something about this, um, this information that could be encrypted, you're breaking the protection of encryption no matter what. Uh, the problem is that even if this is local, right, the fact that you can then decide what and what not will raise an alarm, what and what not will send a report, means that, again, we can have a strong influence in what is being sent. And today is CISAM, but we don't know what is going to be scanned for in the future. And something that is very interesting and is very important to realize is because the introduction of these technologies come from the point of view of CISAM. The list of material that will be checked on has to, by definition, be kept secret. Of course, nobody wants to have all of this CISAM material in the public to be checked on phones. That would defeat the very purpose of preventing CISAM being distributed. That means that we have no means to check what is being um, checked by this local detection, and we have to purely trust that this is never going to be misused in any other direction. And we also find that very problematic because from a technical perspective, again, from a technical side, we have no means to prevent abuse. We have no means to prevent the prevention of privacy. And we have no means to ensure that there will be no errors. Thank you, Carmela. And uh, I'd like to highlight something that you mentioned in your response, uh, that uh, even uh, privacy left aside, there's still uh, the issue of context and uh, which means that the technology would need to understand the context of the uh, dissemination of certain images in order to uh, refrain from, uh, from flagging uh, parents for potential CSAM dissemination, for example. And uh, I get it from you that technology cannot uh, do that yet. 
um, moving to the next question because there is on, uh, we are uh, over time. Encryption has also been at the heart of the controversy of the CSAM proposal. Only recently, uh, Europol released a joint declaration with the European police chiefs urging action against end-to-end -end encryption, citing concerns uh, regarding uh, justice obstruction, with a particular mention on terrorism and CSAM. What lies at the core of the CSAR proposal is the use of on-device detection or the so-called client-side scanning, which is promised to protect encrypted data. How substantiated can this claim be and what risks are associated with client-side scanning? You know, as I explained before, right, if you are scanning, you're breaking the protection of encryption. The same thing as if you look at my letters before I put it on envelopes, you're breaking the confidentiality that the envelope gives. And then we also have this potential for abuse that once you have the capability to look at my letters before I put them in my envelope, nothing prevents you from start checking for uh, grooming, but then continue checking for many other things, political activism, environmental activism, and many other things that happen in the communications. And we have absolutely no way to prevent this from a technical perspective. So introducing these technologies introduces a tool with many, many possibilities and no safeguards as far as we're concerned. Thank you very much, Carmela. I'd like to now immediately move to Michael Tanks, uh, who is here to give us an overview of the situation in UK. Mike is the head of police and public affairs at the Internet Watch Foundation, uh, since uh, and he has been holding this position since two, uh, 2017. He is responsible for representing the organization in UK, EU and internationally. He has worked extensively on the UK's Online Safety Act, dealing with issues related to child sexual abuse and exploitation, age verification and end-to-end -end encryption. Mike, last year the UK adopted a very contested set of measures under the umbrella of the Online Safety Act, which uh, introduced a new regulatory uh, regime to address illegal and harmful content online. Even though its scope is broader than the CSAM regulation, it places new legal obligations and responsibilities on online service providers to keep children safe online by requiring them to prevent, detect, and remove illegal content, among which also child sexual abuse material. What kind of technologies do companies have to use to comply with the requirements of the Online Safety Act? And how effective do you think this law will be in tackling online CSAM? I'm saying will be in the future because it's only recently being adopted. Uh, so I don't know if you, if you already have any data about the impact of, uh, of the act. And do you think this new law helps to solve the problem of online CSAM or at least mitigate it? Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Cesar, and thank you for inviting me to speak today. Um, I think the first thing that I would say is I think we can all agree that child sexual abuse is an absolutely egregious issue. None of the platforms want it on, on their services, and the scale and nature of child sexual abuse has just multiplied exponentially. I will argue that the internet has put rocket fuel under what was becoming um, a, a, a relatively solved problem in terms of its distribution prior to the internet. So we have an explosion of child sexual abuse material online. Emily had some slides earlier that demonstrated this in terms of the amount of reports that have gone to NECMEC. I think it was something like 36 million in the last year. That's, that, that's a pretty big problem. Um, we're seeing self-generated indecent images of children. That makes up 92% of what we remove from the internet. Um, and we're seeing new crimes, so financial um, sextortion of these images as well, where people are actually making money and profiting out of the sexual abuse of children. So it's pretty abhorrent. Um, and obviously our analysts see that day in, day out. They see the rape and sexual abuse of children. So it is absolutely something that needs to be, to be dealt with. We're obviously having a conversation today about specific technologies, but I want to take us back a step before we talk about specific technologies. It's important to remember that whether it's the Digital Services Act in the EU, whether it's the Online Safety Act in the UK, the EU child sexual abuse uh, legislation, that the first requirement that platforms are required to do is assess the level of risk. How likely is it that their services can be abused to distribute um, child sexual abuse imagery? The purpose of the Online Safety Act requires platforms to identify and then manage that risk. Um, and of course, as you've 
rightly highlighted, it's, it's, it's broad. But in, in, in simple terms, they have to have systems and processes in place to swiftly remove illegal content. And they are held accountable to that by an independent regulator. And this is perhaps where there is some difference um, because we'll be looking at, at Ofcom in the UK are, are required to look at, you know, are those systems and processes effective at removing child sexual abuse material? And then they can be fined, and we have senior executive liability as well if that, if that isn't the case. Emily's already taken us through um, hash matching, classifiers, and some grooming mitigations. But Ofcom's approach recently to this in um, a consultation that they published just before Christmas last year, and uh, they're currently finalizing at the moment, recommends hash matching, perceptual hash matching as a technology, URL blocking um, as a technology as well. But importantly, I think um, it focuses in on some other things that are really, really important as well that aren't necessarily what I'd call automated content moderation requirements like hash matching, URL blocking, keyword detection, or grooming mitigations. They look at exploring things like default settings for children using a service, so not presenting prompts to children to expand their social networks, children not being included in publicly visible lists, not having access to direct messaging functionality that's directly connected to friend request lists, that gives them the option of, uh, uh, of informed um, opinions about whether to accept messages from people that they don't know. Uh, automated, cont uh, automated location settings are turned off by default, because all of these things can help make a child's experience uh, m more safe um, uh, online. And then, of course, there are mitigations around making sure that these are on as default on a child's account, and therefore they have to turn them off, and ensuring that there is uh, appropriate advice, etc. Now, the reason that I think this is, is so important is because there was an offender in the UK called David Wilson. He made 500 approaches to children. And of those 500 approaches, he got roughly a 10% feedback, so around 50 children sending uh, images of themselves over Facebook Messenger to him, and he groomed and exploited them. Now, David Wilson never would have been caught had we not had these detection tools that Emily spoke about um, in place, but I'd argue that he shouldn't have been able to do that in the first place in terms of some of these mitigations. So I, I really hope that they, that they do bite. Um, the second thing is we've had a lot of di uh, discussion already around end-to-end um, -end encryption. And one of the things I was really pleased to see in terms of Ofcom's um, measures here is that they've actually said that end-to-end -end encryption is a specific risk factor um, for the distribution of child sexual abuse and exploitation material online um, and, and is something that is, is going to need to be mitigated. So I'd argue that far from uh, protecting children, it, it, Ofcom has a clear evidence base that that isn't the case. Um, and of course, um, in these environments, the, the, the Online Safety Act says that you can't um, apply automated content moderation, but I'd argue that you should be looking at some of these more default settings. And, and of course, the Online Safety Act does provide for safety by design. So I'd like to see platforms being safer for children to use before they, before they come out, rather than actually um, more dangerous or inherently risky. So again, I refer back to that this has to go back to systems and processes. I think the other thing that the Online Safety Act does, which is really important, is it sets government governance requirements on companies as well. So it embeds risk assessment as part of the process, and uh, that that should report to um, the highest possible levels within a company, so that we are taking a much more safety-centric approach to, to, to risk as well. So um, th th there's a lot... In, in short, uh, that is contained within the Act. Um, and also just to include something that I do think is, is really important, um, the Online Safety Act has a section in it which um, can require the, the regulator, if it has clear and evident, um, evidence-based risk of harm, it means that enforcement action can be taken against the platform to require them to use certain technologies, or if those technologies don't exist, to use their best endeavours to uh, detect child sexual abuse material in end-to-end in -end encrypted environments. And I do think that that is a really, really important way for sort of raising the bar. Um, you asked me some other questions in terms of what will be the impact. Well, it's really difficult to tell at the moment because we are in this phase 
of waiting for the code to practice to come in. And then, of course, we'll see what the, the output and throughput will be of this enforcement action. But the fact is that we haven't, we haven't been here before. And what we're doing at the moment isn't enough because there is an explosion of child sexual abuse material online and it's a huge problem. So I think we have to try. We have to try to raise the bar here. I'm hopeful that the Online Safety Act, the CSAM legislation, the DSA um, will do that. But there are, there are ever evolving gaps. I mean, when we started out on the uh, Online Safety Act, I never thought we would be in the situation where generative AI would be a significant uh, problem and some of the nudifying technology that we're seeing as well means that if there is an innocent photo of you online um, in a bikini or swimwear, it can just be nudified now and used to sex thought uh, images of, of children. So there will always be technical problems, but um, I think we need to look at you know the safety by design um, uh, approach that that is afforded in the act um, and hope that we can have a better world than than we currently do. Thank you, Mike. Thank you also for mentioning the risk-based approach and uh, with the new changes to the CSR uh, proposal, uh, they also have introduced the risk-based approach, which I, I, I'm sure uh, Mark will touch upon. Uh, uh, one last question that I'd like to ask to you is uh, to connect also with Emily's presentation. <coughs> is uh, Thorns a tool to detect grooming used in UK? And uh, if not, do you already have another grooming detection tool uh, used in UK, and then uh, since you mentioned that uh, you also work uh, in uh, cooperation with uh, uh, outside, you work outside EU bo UK borders as well. Do you have? Uh, does Internet Watch Foundation have any data about what kind of technologies are used in Europe for grooming detection? So the IWF provides hash lists, URL lists to to our members, um, and they are used broadly and widely across the world. Um, what we find is that platforms tend to take a global approach to these things. So um, technical tools that either Thorn provide or the IWF provide, to be honest, a lot of the companies are probably already using both. Um, and, and they are being used internationally. So whether these are being used in Europe or the UK, it, you know, it, to be honest, it really doesn't make a difference. It's being used um, all over the world at the moment. Uh, as I said, in terms of like the UK's approach to, to grooming, the, the approach that they've taken is to look at safety by design and, and ensuring that the, the platforms are safe by design. So there are 10 mitigations that Ofcom have suggested, um, and I think they're really sensible suggestions. They build on the basis of what we've seen on the age-appropriate design code already. Ensuring that children have age-appropriate experiences online is going to be absolutely really, really important um, to, to driving at, at the heart of this problem. And, and Kamala also mentioned earlier about uh, age verification and age assurance. That will also be really, really important because it shouldn't be good enough that a child can just say, yes, I'm over this age, or amend their birthday in such a way that they can just open an account um, and, and easily circumvent the protections that are there to, to protect them. Um, it's all too easy to circumvent it, I think. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, I'd like to move immediately to uh, Dr. Mark Laser. Mark works at the Amsterdam Law and Technology Institute at the VU Amsterdam and specializes in digital, legal, and platform regulation. He has organized two expert workshops on the CSAM proposal and spoken to various stakeholders on the legality of the CSAM regulation. Mark, what do you think are the most problematic issues of the CSAM proposal from a legal perspective? What fundamental rights are mostly affected? Um, thank you for the introduction. Thank you to my uh, colleagues on the panel for uh, some enlightening uh, discussions about the technology in play and their role in preventing the distribution of CSAM. Um, it won't be any great surprise that I probably represent the, the group of people that are uh, opposed to the CSAM proposal and, and would uh, openly disagree with some of the comments that have been made um, regarding it. Um, we are, you know, we live in Europe. We, we are, and we live under the Charter of Fundamental Rights, and the, the proposal itself uh, is a challenge. Um, the technology that's being used in the, in the proposal uh, presents a challenge uh, to comply with fundamental rights. Um, one of the first things that it does is, um, as lawyers, we think about the necessity and the proportionality test, um, and that any measures that are deployed via the legal machines of the European Union have to comply with these obligations. So the question really isn't about whether or not the fundamental rights of children are protected by the proposal, but whether the infringement of fundamental rights 
uh, in the implementation of the technology that's being proposed by the proposal are proportionate to achieving the objectives of the, of the, um, the EU. Um, the proportion, proportionality, proportionality test of the European Union and the Better uh, Kids Internet Strategy is all about protecting children. And this proposal does not protect children. It is not a proposal that is going to protect children. If you look at the workflow of the proposal, um, it uh, takes simply too long. For some instances, it's envisaged that it would take six months to a year to actually get back to the platforms to make a decision about how they're going to handle the images uh, or the communications under the technology. And in order to implement the proposal, you're going to have to implement technologies which uh, require not only a legal obligation on platforms to break encryption so the technologies that can be used um, by EMILY uh, can be deployed inside of that environment. So yes, it's safe to say and true to say that um, Thorn uh, and other um, technology providers don't break encryption, but the proposal creates a legal obligation to provide backdoors so the technology can be used um, by the EU center. Um, the second thing is that it's a broken workflow in the sense of you only get the detection order after you failed your risk assessment and the risk mitigation measures that are put in place. And so the risk detection order and the obligation to use the detection technologies under the CSAM proposal will be applied after failure in steps. Um, and there you're going to have effectively a sort of regulatory or market arbitrage. So. Uh, what I mean by that is the images that are being stored on one place will just simply move to another place, which will then move to another place, which will then move to another place. And if we want to call that something like market arbitrage or a regulatory arbitrage, it's a big game of whack-a-mole in which uh, bad people storing bad images will simply move from one platform to another. And what will actually happen, um, and we've seen this in other environments, is that the more you take steps to uh, regulate bad people, they tend to move to areas where it's harder for them to be policed and uh, therefore make it harder for law enforcement to actually protect children, which is the overwhelming aim of the proposal. The second thing it does um, is that it, it, it doesn't stop the generation of AI images. So um, that is something that falls outside the remit of the proposal um, and uh, it uh, also creates an environment where people are going to move their communications uh, into encrypted environments as a result of the actual um, uh, complying with the law. So if, if I am going to be committing crime and I'm going to go into a user and interpersonal communications and that is uh, subject to oversight or a detection order, then quite simply you're going to see people moving from one environment to another in order to invade the detection technologies that are being used on that platform because nothing happens simultaneously under the workflow model of the proposal. Um, the second thing that it does, and I think the most important thing for me, is it contravenes existing EU law. There is a prohibition on general monitoring obligations, which is a principle of the e-commerce directive. It's replicated in the Digital Services Act. Um, and to create, and tr uh, let, me, let me back up a step. The proposal doesn't treat known images, unknown images, and grooming solicitations differently, but they are unique in the way that you have to respond as a regulator. And so the IWF, commendable, we, if we could take the known images, we take the approach that was used in the United Kingdom and say, this works, it gets stuff offline, there's a model that works, we put it on a legal basis for the European Union. I think we could all accept that known images, criminality is, uh, is determined, and we want to get those images offline, and we want, to, we want to have some sort of technologies that remove those images or variations of the te technologies. We've learned what works from the IWF for known images. The problem is that the proposal doesn't separate known images from unknown images and grooming solicitation. So then we have the, the role of safety by design via technologies for unknown images and grooming solicitation. Now, Michael's correct. There's lots of things about safety by design that are important to learn from, and I think that part of the EU's problem is that we can um, take a step back and, and think about what works in other environments and apply them to solving this problem, but the CSAM proposal doesn't do that. It is only about really creating an environment for using technologies to detect unknown images, known images, uh, unknown images in CSAM. It doesn't think about design, and it doesn't think about 
um, protecting children in digital spaces from the get-go. So I think that's one of the problems with the proposal itself. Um, the other thing that I would say is it does mandatory age verification by the back door. Um, and most people, I think, would say that that is problematic, and Carmelo, Carmelo uh, talked about that, whether that's whether it's third-party authentication or whether it comes from using technologies. Children will always find a way to circumvent it, uh, and it also creates significant privacy and data protection issues. So uh, to give a, a, maybe a longish answer, because I can go shorter on my, on my subsequent ones, uh, I would say that, let's be honest, there's positive impacts on fundamental rights for children. It protects the integrity of the child. It also protects their privacy, and it also protects their um, uh, uh, from degrading and inhuman treatment. But at the same time, it violates privacy and data protection rights. It violates uh, free expression um, and access to information even. Uh, and it also can violate the non-discrimination principle. So the question then becomes, is it proportionate? Is the infringement itself that will come from the mass scaling of uh, interpersonal communication and the scanning of all images that travel across the European Union's networks, social networks, proportionate to the aim of protecting children. And because that doesn't actually protect children, it only comes down to the remove, it only is going to be about removing the device. It's not going to kill the marketplace. It's not gonna prevent children from abuse. The images and the, the dissemination of children are several steps away from the actual abuse. My, my conclusion is that it's a disproportionate interference with fundamental rights. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, I found it interesting, uh, one of your comments regarding the detection orders, that you see them as an inefficient method, while uh, the aim, the reason why they were introduced as a last resort was to safeguard fundamental rights. Mm -hmm. But it's a very good point that you make. Uh, I'd like to move to the next question and uh, moving uh, this discussion to a sort of a slightly different perspective uh, since this conference is about AI. Uh, how does the use of AI to detect unknown CSAM and text-based grooming in the CSAM proposal, keeping in mind that unknown CSAM might also be AI generated, like you already mentioned, interact with the AI Act's rules? Okay. This is the million euro question because um, it, it, there's no doubt in my mind that the proposal, uh, the CSAM proposal, will cr and the use of AI is going to be a high-risk system. But inadvertently, by characterizing it as a high-risk system under the AI Act, you create legal obligations on all the people that are um, developing these systems for use within the EU Center and uh, likewise. Um, and I think that um, part of that will require a risk management strategy. Um, but you also have legal obligations, which I don't understand how, or I haven't figured out how, uh, the CSAM proposal does not create criminality for some of the people that are going to be, uh, or some of the actors that are going to be um, uh, dealing with the high risk impact of these systems. So for example, you know, if you are using a high risk system to detect CSAM, then part of that is going to be um, training data and data governance and management of the training data that is used inside these systems. Part of that requires uh, legal obligations to comply with the GDPR under data collection uh, rules and data quality rules, um, which require free from errors or at least taking steps to, to prove that you've tried to correct the data that is pumped into a, an AI system to detect CSAM. Um, and you also have to then, under the high-risk rules, uh, process data in a way that respects individual rights and freedoms um, uh, and using anonymization. Now, I don't understand how, if CSAM is, I still haven't figured this out, that if CSAM proposal is suggesting we use AI and the AI system is characterized as, as a high risk and the legal obligation is to anonymize the data that's an output of a, a detection technology, how you then save ch a child. Because it's by a legal obligation to do anonymization as part of the high risk system framework. So uh, again, you, the interaction between these two, it's not really clear to me how um, you're going to comply with that aspect of it. The, as this conference will talk at great, great length, the, there's a significant focus on transparency and explainable 
uh, decisions. How are you going to explain the decisions about um, uh, child technology, uh, detection technologies to children? How are you going to, to do that to people who are erroneously um, flagged for their grooming solicitations? And how do you do it in a way that doesn't reveal the limits or the capabilities of your system to the people who are actually breaking the law in the first place? Um, you also have to have um, feedback loops. Um, and I'm not, I, I, don't, I, I don't see how you're going to have feedback loops that comply with both aspects of the CSAM proposal and the AI Act at the same time. And I also think one of the things that's really going to be interesting to see how um, uh, is the training data. Um, I am not convinced, uh, Emily made a comment earlier about um, uh, what happens to the image after it's been detected. So let's say, for example, an image gets shared via Facebook or Meta, whatever. And um, what happens to that image? Now, it's been made clear to me that the EU center wants that image. Now, if that's for law enforcement purposes, um, that's fine. It's an important evidential chain. But there is some suggestion that the images are going to be then put into the training data to help improve the quality of the uh, detection technologies that are being used to detect CSAM. So now we have real and potential AI-generated CSAM being used in the training data by people who are without the legal protection to handle this material in the first place. Um, because the EU center within the CSAM proposal is not law enforcement. It is another entity that is uh, created uh, to work in co uh, strong conjunction with Europol, but it is not a law enforcement agency. Uh, and so all of these questions about the interactions and the engagement between the CSAM proposal and AI Act are not resolved. And when I've asked questions to the people that have worked in this space at the European Commission, there are, I'll just put it mildly, that there's significant gaps in answers on how they're going to comply with the high risk um, requirements of the AI Act. Thank you very much, Mark. I wonder whether the hash matching technology would solve the problem of not using the images as a training data, but we'll leave that for <laughs> later because uh, we have very few minutes left, so I'd like to see whether there are any questions from the audience. Um, thank you for this, uh, this, this, this great um, introduction and great panel. I have one concrete uh, question to Emily. Um, you mentioned for the detection of unknown CSAM, you were unlikely to be wrong, but can you put an estimate on the unlikeliness of, of being wrong? Is it like, <laughs> is it 0.0%? Is it like so, point, point yeah, zero, zero, zero percent? <laughs> That kind of figures. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so the way it's done and the way it's uh, tr uh, kind of explained is through kind of your precision and your recall rate. So what is the threshold that a company chooses to put onto the classifier? Um, we only set it at 99.9% uh, precision rate. Um, so we do put it at the highest possible point. A company could choose to lower it, but it comes into the implementation of how a company chooses to use our classifier. Yeah, so that means that you have like a failure rate of uh, point, uh, point 0.1% percent to be uh, incorrectly as for a false positive. And now coming back to what Comella said about the millions or billions of images being shared, and if you, do the, if you do the math there, there will be millions of images potentially flagged that are, in fact, not um, bad images. And this is maybe a question to the panel in general, like how would the, the European agency responsible for responding to these reports have to deal with, with the, the, the massive wave of messages that basically will be thrown at them, um, given these. I mean, it's a low, it's, I mean, the threshold is low. I mean, it's impressive in a way, but still, it is creating a significant influx of false positives to the downstream agencies having to deal with that. So, so how, how to do that? I'll take a stab at it, and then I think uh, others might want to as well. I think for us, when you come into that, you know, that... 0.1%, yes, we would love technology to be 100% accurate, but if anybody ever claims that it's 100% accurate, we know they're lying. Um, but when it comes to the implementation, the, the reason I went through all of those technologies, even though I know the question was only for the two, was to explain that it's a layered approach. So oftentimes you first start with hashing and matching. It's, a, it's it, the lower compute power, it's a lot easier to do. Then if things are flagged, that's when a classifier is deployed. 
No company is using a classifier across every single image that they have. No one has the compute power or would spend that kind of cost to do it. So there is a bit of a staged approach. So when we say there's going to be a million because whatever fraction you choose to use, it's not actually going to be at that speed because they oftentimes are doing quite a few different things before they get all the way to an image classifier. Let me, get, let me get that straight. You're suggesting that the, 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 the client-side scanning is actually not using the classifier on any, every and all images that a user sends out just because of the sheer computational cost of doing that? No platform that I've ever talked to uses a classifier across all of their content. But that is what the European Commission requires you to do as soon as the CSAM proposal is, is, is becomes law, right? I mean, you have to apply the classifier, you have to apply it to every image. And, but you're I mean, it depends on how they actually write a detection order, which I think is still a little bit fuzzy mm -hmm. um, in all intents and purposes. Um, also, to be clear, I wouldn't necessarily propose the proposal that's on the table the way it is either. That wouldn't actually be how we would write it ourselves as well. Okay, that's interesting, but maybe a topic for further conversation later. Thank you. Maybe uh, Mike or Mark want to uh, make a comment to this? I think, Emily, you can correct me if, if my understanding is that you can always get a 99.9, .9 if, if you, your number, if you have, if you're willing to accept that that is going to increase a significant number of false positives. No, so or you can tweak it down well, and no, get so a smaller number of false positives. There are four things that come into that statistic. It's your true positive, your true negative, your false positive, your false negative. Mm -hmm. Your precision rate is how much of that material is what you say it is. Mm -hmm. The thing that is affected based off of your precision rate, so if I lowered my precision rate, my recall rate would improve. Your recall rate is how much of the material you're trying to identify are you identifying. So it's your kind of accuracy and then how much of that data. Mm -hmm. So it's slightly different than what you're saying. Okay, but regardless of the false positive, also the false negative, and the, the, four, the four that you came up with, the question then becomes, in order to get there, you still have to do this massive wholesale surveillance of all images, communications, um, that, that to get to these positions. And I think for, for people who care about the fundamental rights aspects of this proposal, um, the numbers of 99.9 .9 become kind of irrelevant if the, if the data retention and the data processing that takes place to get there is the wholesale violation of fundamental rights. And then it becomes, well, do we want to create, I think um, the comment here was about, well, the false negative, the false positives or the, the false negatives then become, somebody has to do something with them, right? You've got this kind of thing, you've identified CSAM, you, you, the aim is to protect children, so you've now got a large data set where you don't know the difference between false positives and real images, AI images now, and then maybe a, another classifier would be a, an image which is actually AI, which we don't know it's AI because it's so good, so the police are investigating an AI image that, in order to prevent the harm associated with a child without there ever being a child that is actually real that is worthy of, of protecting, or maybe it's a bad phrase, but there's not a real child that could be a subject of an investigation and protection phase. So um, uh, maybe the, the, a better way to think about that, that this is, is to maybe if the EU took an, a, a different approach and actually put the same level of money into social services and, and policing, and you know, we've done this before, and you know, I disagreed with one of Michael's comments about we've never been in this position before. We have been in this position before in a number of different spheres, and what we've learned from data retention, and what we've learned from state surveillance, and what we've learned from terrorist propaganda, and what we've learned for is that red flagging content doesn't work. Like, we, we've done this a number of different spheres, and we've all co always come to the same conclusion that uh, yeah, you know, red flagging terrorist content doesn't reduce terrorism. What reduces terrorism is putting spies in the sp uh, regal human beings uh, in the space to try and stop people from uh, committing egregious acts. And that if we rely on these kind of technological solutions and safety by design, that we can look at areas where we've, we've failed and we're making the same kind of mistake again in a, just a different type of content that's been generated. And that uh, maybe we should wouldn't say scrap the proposal, I think we could say um, 
known images, we need an EU approach to known images, but maybe we should rethink our entire approach to solving uh, the problem of child abuse by going after the people who are abusing the children in the first place, and then spending a significant amount of time looking at the markets in which these um, images are shared and going after the markets rather than infringing the fundamental rights of people that aren't doing anything wrong. Thank you. Can I, can I add? Yes, sure. Uh, so first, let me say that I subscribe everything that Mark say. Mark, thank you very much for your points. But again, from, from a technical perspective, there are two things here that need to be clarified. So one is that uh, I think Emily said that you could apply first the hashing before the classification. But again, the goal of these two technologies is different. Hashes can only deal with known material. If you do that, you will never find the known material. And also you will be taking the hit of the errors of the hashes, which may be higher. And I think, I mean, I don't know exactly where the numbers are now, but are not 99.9%. Then as Jap Hank said, uh, this 1%, uh, the 0.1% error is already huge and would flood uh, law enforcement, who, which there are many reports in which they say they already cannot deal with the amount of reports that they have today. So it is not clear how they would handle something. And one more point um, that kind of came a little bit in Mark's, in Mark's speech is this idea of the adversarial kind of nature of the problem. So we also know that technically it is extremely easy to actually fool these classifiers. If you modify a little bit the image, you can actually pull the perceptual hashing, you can fool the other classifier. You can also change platform. And at the end of the day, what we have is a technology that doesn't, it's not effective against uh, the, the, the criminals that they wanted to do. And this is not that you need a lot of technology and a lot of savviness. We just need one person to put a tool online that says you put your image here, it changes three pixels and we're done. But on the other hand, it will be actually surveilling everyone, right? And the problem here, and, and also it's not all about, oh, it reaches privacy. The question is that the benefit versus cost, it just does not work. Like benefit is basically, no, we have no evidence. And we have a lot of evidence that the cost is huge for society. Thank you, Carmela. Do we have any other questions? Maybe we can take the question and then you can, because there is only five minutes left. Let, let Michael say his comment. Yeah, please go ahead. Th thank you very much. So just, just a few things I'd like to come back to. For, uh, firstly, um, the, a previous comment that was made, made sounded very much like we shouldn't deal with the problem because it would flood law enforcement. I don't think, that, I don't think that's a great, um, a, approach to be taking. Uh, secondly, just to, to come back on a point that Mark made about fundamental rights, um, when we look at um, Article 8, uh, it's a qualified right. So there are times when, um, the, you know, the right to privacy, it, it, it's a qualified right. So in just uh, the phrase here is, except in such accordance with the law and is necessarily in democratic society in uh, in preservation of interest of national security, public safety, economic well-being of a country, the pres preservation of disorder or crime, the protection of health or morals, or protection of insight and freedom to others. So I, there is an imperative, I think, there to act because children also have rights not to be sexually abused, not to have that uh, distributed um, online. Uh, just to pick up on another point as well, uh, Mark, I know you made the comment about going after children, uh, going after people that abuse children. How do you do that if you can't, if there, if there aren't tools to, to, to detect the sexual abuse of children? So just going back to the case that I made previously in terms of uh, David Wilson, how would he have been detected? A man that's tried to approach 500 children and received 50 images, how, how would we detect that? Because without some of the, the, the technology there that currently reported through to NECMEC, he wouldn't have been detected and he'd have been allowed, allowed to abuse huge numbers of individuals. That can't, Individual, individual children. That comes at a huge cost to society in terms of the, the onward health impacts, et cetera, um, as well. The estimates in the UK are that 1.3 to 1.6% of people um, in the adult population pose some form of sexual threat to children. So the, the scale of this is massive. It, it, is, it is a really big problem. And then just on end-to-end -end encryption, we accept um, when we go to airports that our bags are scanned uh, before we take a flight. 
and they're looking for very specific things. That's the same in terms of de the, the detection of child sexual abuse imagery um, within those environments as well. We're looking for a very specific piece of content. So uh, I don't think it. I don't think it's um, you, you know the blanket detection. We are looking for for very highly targeted. Uh, child sexual abuse material that's being distributed as well. So just, just a couple of comments that I wanted to come back I'm to. I'm not sure that my boxer shorts and my socks are comparable to my private communications. I mean, if I put my bags through the scanner at the airport, um, we're talking about looking for bombs that are, you know, r r destructing life. Um, yeah, I don't think it's a comparison. Uh, the other thing is, I've, I've, I've heard this from child protection and child safety, but uh, you're unfortunately not gonna get off the hook uh, this time, because I've, I've sat quietly on this comment. You know, this idea that flooding law enforcement um, as being, uh, we shouldn't talk about the effect on law enforcement as a thing, uh, this needs to be explained and justified. Because if the aim and the objective is to protect children, you don't flood law enforcement with images. Law enforcement in member states have been very clear that they don't want this proposal because it is not going to, it is going to interfere with their ability to make real insights into um, protecting children uh, on the ground because they're gonna be dealing with searching the metadata and the images that are they're flooding their offices. It's a, it's a legitimate uh, point about justification of proportionality uh, and the relative to the whether it can objectively solve the problem. And the third thing is, uh, the David Wilson, is it David Wilson? Yeah. I mean, it, it, if this is a person that's contacted 500 children, um, and earlier we said that technology is new, the idea that David Wilson wouldn't have been doing this at the park, you know, or, or doing this in a different environment, that this is only happening because of technology, these two things can't be reconciled. If you have 1.3 people, percentage of, of society that are inclined to do this, then it's a societal problem. It is a complex societal problem that is going to exist whether or not technology is here or not. The only thing that you're trying to do is use mass surveillance to take off this, um, to, to, to remove one image from a platform. And under the proposal, it doesn't meet the objectives of general interest, which is to protect children. You're only removing part of the problem, part of the time, and part of the way. If you took a wholesale approach to protecting children because it's a complex societal issue, rather than a safety by design and using technological tools, which are dubious at best, 99.9 .9 I think is, is, is a pipe dream, of a, a technologist pipe dream, it, 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 there's nothing to suggest that the technology comes close to those rates. But the point that was made here is that the false positives and flooding law enforcement actually makes protecting children harder. And if you are um, failing uh, law enforcement, then you're also failing children. And so you're, nobody is questioning whether the, uh, the, your approach is right, your hearts are in the right place, everybody's just trying to come up with a solution within the framework in which we operate, and that's under the Charter of Fundamental Rights. And it has to be proportionate to the objective. And if it doesn't solve the problem, if it actually makes law enforcement um, uh, jobs harder, then you have to justify the outcome relative to the objective. And I think that's where it fails. And, and if I may add one thing, because I found very funny this example of the airport and the check-in, because it's actually a very great example about how surveillance changes the way in which we behave. Because indeed, I mean, I don't care about my socks, but because I may care about what these people see there and that the thing is on the screen and more people may see, I'm not gonna put in my hand luggage anything that I deem something that I wouldn't wanna share. And this is what can happen with communications is that then we're just not going to communicate about things. We're going to change the way in which we're living. This is a chilling effect. And actually vigilance in airports is kind of a great example of how this changes the way in which we have relationships. Thank you, everyone. Let's take uh, the question. Uh, Professor Lies, actually, I was going to comment on that that you just mentioned because irrespective of the regulation, so I'm not a lawyer, I'm also a technologist and I'm not going to favor the technology, but what I'm going to say that child, children were abused
for the last 200 years, probably 300 years, we know. Now we see the dissemination at a very high speed because of internet, that how they can uh, spread one picture within seconds with the millions of people. Now when we are looking at uh, uh, the encryption that play a role, photo DNA, the technology that was being used before encryption came into picture, and we were talking about that photo DNA is also working on the technology that they will be able to do encryption, encrypted images detection as well. Now, look, looking at the aspect, again, I'm, uh, I, I really respect the fundamental rights in EU and so on. So we look at the trade of how shall we uh, respect the privacy, how shall we pro respect the fundamental rights. At the same time, we want to protect the children as well. Now, coming to the second uh, side of the coin that probably, as you mentioned, that how shall we uh, get off the problem itself? Like, we see that there are pedophiles in the society, so how can we remove those pedophiles in the society? But when you commented on uh, social awareness, so if the social awareness will be always very uh, effective, then there will be no druggist in the society. The government and NGOs, they are working on druggists for 100 years, but still we have druggists. So let's say if we work only on social awareness and we try to find out, attack only those pedophiles who are active in abusing the children, but I think this problem will still be there. So um, what would be your suggestion? How do we say that, okay, we are respecting fundamental rights, we are respecting privacy, we want to protect children as well. We don't want to abuse the technology, we don't want to abuse the platform. So nobody's taking the responsibility, neither from the platform side, nor from the government side. So this is like, <laughs> thank you. Was that to me or was that to the pet? Okay. Everybody has dog different. Does anyone want to take this question? Yeah, I don't, I don't mind. So, uh, so I agree with what you said, that <laughs> it's a real challenge, right? And I also agree with the point that Mark made that, um, you know, I would love to see more investment in, pre in prevention in communities and, and you know, uh, the, the familial problem of, of child sexual abuse. Yeah, absolutely. I fully support it. We need a whole system approach to it. But it's not neither or. It's not we have society interventions and we just leave, you know, we have no tools on, on, online to detect child sexual abuse. That, that's just ridiculous because the scale of the problem is so large in terms of the distribution of images online that it, it has to be addressed. We have to be looking at, I, I outlined earlier, safety by design, but technical tools are also part of the, of the solution as well. Um, and and th there's a balance to be struck. Um, it's not an either or. I'll come in quickly because it's a lot of ditto as would be expected between myself and Mike. Um, but obviously I'm oftentimes put specifically in the technological bucket because that's what we do. Um, we think it's an important tool, but it isn't the only tool in order to actually tackle this. We need all of it. We need better investment in social services. We need better research into offenders and why they do what they do. We need the technology because it's a technology enabled crime. And so do law enforcement. The other part of the work that we haven't discussed here that Thorne does is we actually do work with law enforcement to kind of give them better case management tools to help with that flood, to help them case manage. There's a million things we can do. We need investment across the board. It's not just about this technology. The reason we're talking about just this technology though is this regulation was written because there is a legal gap um, with e-privacy. So we're looking for that long-term solution. As I said, wouldn't be my first choice in how we've done this and how it's been designed and things like that, but that's the reason we're talking and having this discussion about this particular piece of regulation is that if we do not have something, there is a legal gap where none of this detection for any of it can be done. Um. One thing we can do is we can value encryption and we can use encrypted environments to keep children safe from bad people. And when we saw Ofcom saying that encryption is a risk, you know, but we should take the opposite approach and value encryption and take encryption, encrypted environments as safe spaces where children can stay away from bad people. I mean, the, the, we cannot, we can't continue this, this fairy tale that any proposal that comes out of government is going to solve a complex issue. Um, but what we can do is create, use technology to protect children where it's appropriate. And it's not appropriate to do it in a way that violates um, fundamental rights. Or, or the, the solution that we operate under has to comply with our framework. So that's a, a give and take that um, we should um, cherish, actually, because we're going to get to the right solution for all the uh, people affected by the regulation. I just want to come back on one point. Um, might, this might be an unpopular opinion, but I don't understand how end-to-end -end encryption can, can 
protect children online when hash matching, etc., doesn't work in those environments. Um, I, I just don't understand how children will be safer. Because you stop people that want to talk to them from entering the environment. You create a safe space for them that um, means that somebody wishing to groom can't enter the space without permission from the authority that controls the environment. I mean, grooming solicitation is the, 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 the chatting of children uh, and the creating the safe spaces is something that um, uh, lawmakers are actually looking at. So I think we should um, uh, uh, accept that encryption has value and there's loads of case studies. I don't know where Ofcom comes from evidence-based. Uh, I'm co-author of a report that's coming out from the Internet Society in which we look at the value of encryption in keeping uh, children safe. So I don't accept that um, the use of encryption uh, is, a, is a risk factor. It should be valued and treated um, appropriately. I don't know if Carmela wants to I add something to, to wrap up the debate. <laughs> I mean, there are two things. One is like we're talking all the time about this volume of child abuse. And uh, again, we all agree that this needs to be, we need to have an end, right? Nobody wants this thing. But you're avoiding all the time talking about the volume of harm that can come from trying to solve that problem in this technocentric way. And how much, how many people are involved and how many activists, how many non-activists and how many of these things can be affected because that needs to be taken into account. Otherwise, right, we don't care about side effects, and that is very problematic. The second thing is that no other particular thing that encryption, you, we can do this thing of closing the space to only the good people. Again, technology cannot distinguish good people and bad people. We don't know how to do that. But we know that encryption and having a safe place that where nowadays most actually children and adolescents actually talk over digital platforms. They need that privacy. They need that freedom to develop themselves. Right? And we know, especially particular communities, transsexual kids, kids discovering the sexual identity, they need that space. Eliminating the right to having that also makes children unsafe in a different way. And we need to talk about all the dimensions and not only focus on one, because if we kind of ignore all of the side effects that everything that we do can put into place, then we may end up in a worse place, even if we can solve the problem, which we cannot. But even if we could, again, the consequences, you need to talk about them. If you just ignore all of those, then this conversation is kind of one-sided and it doesn't make sense. And I will consider that a wrap because we are over time. <laughs> thank you to our panelists for your uh, valuable contribution and thank you to all of you for your engagement. Let's continue this critical conversation beyond today, working together to create a safer online environment for our children. Have a nice day.